Lord, help us today. Lord, hold our hands again. Hold our steps in your word. Teach us your word. Let us grow. Let our lives be transformed. Change our hearts. Change our lives. Help us that we will become more conformed to the image of your son, that we will do more, that we will be able to serve you more and be able to fulfill your plan for us. Help us, O oh Lord, today. Use this morning, use this service for us again. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise Jesus. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's good to see you all. I hope you had a good week. Praise God. So, um, it's been four Sundays now, right? Today is the fifth Sunday. We're talking about, we've been going through the book of Galatians, Mount um, Sinai and Zion. And we've been looking at, you know, Paul's explanation of the gospel. Hallelujah. Of what the grace of God is, what justification really is, what righteousness by faith really is. Hallelujah. Um, we've said a whole lot. Um, it's, it's something that is worth going over again and again and again till our hearts are, you know, really full and it has soaked into our hearts. You know, I'll tell you something. The gospel is not boring. Praise God. The gospel is not boring. If you see someone that seems, if it begins to feel boring to you, it means you are no more seeing it. You are no more seeing it. If it doesn't feel like good news anymore, and it feels like normal news, it feels like dry news, it doesn't feel like good news to you, it means that you are not seeing it. It means that you are not paying attention to it anymore. Hallelujah. Because the gospel, when it's truly understood, it affects every area of your life. It touches every area of your life. Every area of your life becomes sweet. Your entire life, your whole Christianity changes. Your whole Christianity changes. People have been looking for the solution to their life's problems in the wrong things. People have been looking for the solution to their life's problems in the wrong things. You know, if the solution to all your life's problems is what God did for us, applied in that area. Hallelujah. When you see the gospel, it changes your outlook on marriage and relationships. It changes the way you think of work. It changes your attitude to sin. It changes the way you approach fulfilling your purpose and the way you conduct yourself in this world. It changes the way you treat other people. It changes everything. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, these things are more than just good messages because there's a way that the gospel can become entertaining and not transforming. Do you understand what I just said now? Let me say it well. There's a way that the gospel can become entertaining. There's a way the gospel can become entertaining. So there's a kind of... Um, I don't know how to describe it. I don't know the right word to use for it. There's a kind of pleasure. There's a faculty that God has put inside of us as, as human beings whereby thoughts, thoughts that make sense are sweet to us. Thoughts that make sense are sweet to us. I don't know how to explain it in lay words, right? But there is a capacity inside of us. So there are different kinds of pleasures that we have. I'm going to look more at that today. There are different kinds of pleasures inside of us. And one of the pleasures that we have is difficult to explain. Um, we, don't come on with God. We, are not, we don't use this kind of, we don't talk like this commonly, but let me just try. God will help me. It's a kind of pleasure that we enjoy as human beings when thoughts make sense. There's a satisfaction you have when you put together a syllogism that if A is true and B is true, therefore C must be correct. There's a way it is nice to our minds. We enjoy it. That's the word. So that's the reason, that's the reason why we delight in having certain conversations. That is the essence of all us. When people are talking on social media, people are arguing and all that. When you're arguing Cyril Ronaldo versus Messi, what is happening there is that depending on which view that you have, right? Let me not divide my church this morning. <laughs> Depending on the view that you have, putting together one person's stats and saying, this person has objectively more goals 
means he must be a better player. There's a way putting together that thinking makes sense to you. And another person now says, no, he doesn't have as many goals, but if you calculate goals per number of matches played or number of years practice is more. And then it's that there's a way it works. So even in the gospel, when we're talking about spiritual things, that is the reason why Christianity is particularly satisfying in that when you begin to look at Christian theology, Christian ideas and the gospel, there's a way it makes sense and can be satisfying. That's the reason why those of you that are young, that you know, you're, when you're in school, you're a word person and all that, you wanted to go to a word church. In fact, there's some of you that maybe the reason why I came to this church is that you wanted to go to a word church. And it can become a kind of word tourism. I'll be using that word more frequently because I know what I'm saying. Because there's a satisfaction you have, you enjoy, there's a satisfaction you get from when someone puts Rema down or exposes his scripture. Bah, 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 bah. There's a kind of satisfaction you have. And so there's a way that listening to the gospel can become very, for lack of a better word, entertaining without it actually transforming your life. And where the line is, is that you spend time pondering on what we have been saying. We talk, we've said so much about legalism. We've said so much about the grace of God. We've said so much. You need to actually spend time thinking about it, not just enjoying it when it's being taught, but actually thinking about it. That what does this mean for me? In which ways have I been legalistic in my life? In which ways have I been looking at the grace of God in my life as a result of what I have done? You think you figured it out, but you have not. You think it has entered your heart, but it has not. It begins to show in little, little things. When you're thinking of your marriage and your relationship and your marriage is your, because your marriage is, is very good or your relationship is good and people are asking you how it is going, you find yourself unconsciously talking about how you are very intentional about doing things, how you are very intentional about doing things. But if you understand the grace of God, the first thing you understand is that everything about that relationship is the grace of God that you have. These things show in subtle ways. Part of the reason why you are still running and around and trying to impress people is because you have not heard the gospel. It has not entered your psychology. You grew up with certain kind of baggage. Maybe you have all kind of family issues. Your father wasn't there for you or your mother was constantly killing your self-esteem and that thing is just in your life. It has just shaped your mind on a subconscious level that for you to feel okay, you are constantly looking for respected people to say they are cool with you or you are constantly looking for people that are respected to admit that there's something great about you. You need this validation, right? And you, it's just there. It's just there. It just makes you a people pleaser, makes you someone that is subconsciously, constantly trying to do things for attention. The gospel is what heals those kind of wounds. It's not therapy. Therapy cannot solve that kind of problem because what happens is that if you have that kind of problem, if you have that kind of baggage in your mind, all you can do is someone comes to tell you that stop looking for the validation of those people. When you shift that desire to something else and make it shift it to looking for the validation of the therapist. <laughs> so you are doing it, you are not looking for the validation of people because the therapist said so. Do you understand what I just said now? This thing I said is psychological. I don't know if you can understand, but I know what I'm saying. The only solution to this thing, to the gospel, is to this kind of problem, is the gospel. When you realize that despite the kind of terrible person you are, God Almighty has said, I love you. You didn't hear it. I want to see what light I like more be like, but you don't. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't hear it. If you hear it, that God Almighty, in whom all of creation finds his existence, has looked at you and he has called you, he foreknew you, and he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son, and he's working in you a coming glorification. It just kills it. Like, it just kills it. Because even the human being that is, you are looking for his validation, is even a creature like you. Who needs the validation of this same God? It kills it. The reason why you are struggling to forgive, the reason why you are struggling to forgive in your marriage, and you want your partner to earn your, your, your happiness or your positive disposition, you want the person to earn it, there is that need for retribution. You, you have been trying and you have been doing good to your, to your spouse. You've been 
going above and beyond. You have been thinking of the person, planning things for the person. But the person seems to just be absent-minded in the marriage and relationship, and the person is just enjoying the relationship while you, you are working. And then you get angry. And the reason why you want retribution, you want the person to also work and know what it is like. The reason why that feeling is so crippling that you subconsciously are finding yourself revenging in little things is because you've not heard the gospel very well. When you hear the gospel very well, it's clear that everything that you have in your life is not because you're a good person. You say you know you're not a good person. It's because someone was able to look at your best efforts that was rubbish and still say, you know what? I will give. It makes you realize that, ah, if despite how much I am broken, someone can love me, then this guy, that this person in my relationship that I'm so angry at, is not different from me. That's why legalism gives people a sense of superiority. It gives them, because legalists tend to have a low view of God or a high view of themselves. It's because you have a low view of God that you think that your works can achieve God's grace. Or you think that you are very high, or God is almost your mate. That's why you think that if you try hard enough, you can meet up to God's standard. It's one of those two. And that's where that sense of superiority comes in. Because you have a low view of God, you have a low view of other people too. You think it's because you're better than other people. But trust me, it's not because you're the better person in the relationship. Church, I hear what I'm saying to you. You must contemplate. That's why Paul said that I'm so surprised that you're already departing to another gospel, which is no gospel. I'm surprised they're already departing to another gospel. He said, it is no gospel because he says, see, if anybody teaches any other thing, let the person be accursed. Because this is the gospel. This is the operating system of the Christian's life. You know, we are running around looking for a motivational speaker, looking for a breakthrough service, looking for all those things. Those running around is proof that you have, people have not heard the gospel. There is a certain kind of rest. There is a certain kind of calmness. There is a certain kind of rest that comes upon a man when a man has realized that God is the one that moved first in my direction. There's a certain kind of rest, there's a certain kind of calm that comes upon a man when a man realizes, now man being human beings, all right, say, hey, that comes upon a person when the person realizes that God is the one that moved first in my direction. There's a certain kind of running around. Huh? There's one example. There's one example that Tim Keller likes to use. I love that example so much. It's the example of Jacob. How that when Jacob was young, probably because he had daddy issues, your daddy does not like you, but your mommy likes you. And every man wants the validation of his dad. He now wants to go and deceive his elder brother to get the brother's birthright. And because actually and in reality, even if the father mistakenly blesses you, at the end of the day, when the father's eye clear, they will not still give you the property. That's why at the end of the day, they still give everything to Esau. So the question was, why, when he knew that they, even if he did a trick, the father still prayed for Esau. The property, they will still give Esau. He knew. He knew that if he does that kind of thing, he, pro- he cannot live in the same house with his brother again. Why did he do it? As Tim Keller will, do, will say that the need for his father's validation was so strong that despite how irrational, how irrational it was in ancient Near East culture, there was no way, there's no way he can get the, the firstborn's property. He can't. He knew, despite how irrational it was, he was begging, just anything to shall get that father's blessing, get that father's validation. Because of that, he had to run out of his father's house, run somewhere to go and work 14 years before he could marry the kind of woman that he was. So far, so pepe. After God has dealt with him, dealt with him, he now said he wants to go back to his father's land. That night, on the way back, he had an encounter with God. Nothing else said when he saw God. He now said, I will not let you go until you bless me. That point when Jacob finally understood that the blessing that he needs is the one that God gives. Ah! 
when he finally understood that the blessing that a man needs is not all those things. It's not my father's validation. It's not, my, it's not Esau being happy with me. It's not having a wife that I want. He said, I will not let you go until you bless him. And the Lord blessed him. That was the day he realized that the blessing, what makes me who I am, is the blessing of God. <laughs> not my brother's birthright. Not the attention of my father. What defines me is the blessing of God. Guess what? You have the blessing of God. Did you hear what I just said now? You did not hear. I say, guess what? You have the blessing. That thing that Jacob was fighting all night for. Strong fight all night. You have it. Because Jesus paid the price. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And so, that's why running up and down, behaving like Esau, pre-blessing, is not necessary. So, tell you what I'm saying to you. Contemplate on the gospel. Ponder on the gospel. Hallelujah. So, today we're going to chapter 5. We're taking time. Try and run through it. Today we're going to chapter 5. Now, after Paul has said so much about how the law is not, um, you know, we are not working for righteousness, rather we are working from righteousness. After Paul has spent so much time explaining that we are not working for righteousness, rather we are working from righteousness, that our righteousness, our justification is a gift that even by our own power, we cannot earn God's righteousness, right? So we are no more under the law. We are no longer under the ceremonial laws of the Jewish people or as pagans or Gentiles. We are no, more, no longer under those laws and elements of this world that we needed, that we're doing in order to please God. We are not under any law anymore. We're not, we're not, we're not under the law anymore. We're no longer under the elements of this world, right? Because our righteousness is a gift. The next question will now be, and this is why the gospel is a complete speaking there's a complete explanation of the gospel and so paul now goes on to finish the teaching of the gospel he has gone he's now going forward to finish the conversation of the gospel because the next question to now answer is that what is the necessity of our works if we are not working for righteousness righteousness has been given to us if before we were working so that we can achieve righteousness that thing we're working for they've given us what are we still working for Hallelujah. So do you understand that? Do you hear what I just said now? If we were working for righteousness and God has given us that righteousness without our works, the next question is, what are we now working for? Apart from, I'm following up to that, following up to that as well, what are we, I'm following up to that question, what are we working for? That's number one. The second question that follows it is, what are we working for? Then also, how do we know the kind of works to do? Because when we're under the elements of the world, that pagan ancestors, our, our, the gods of our, of our fathers, will tell us that once in every year, bring a young man that you sacrifice, that will beat him with, um, will flog him with jazz, and he will run mad and enter the bush. That's the only way that rain will fall that year. Or sacrifice a human being to the gods. You know? Or if you see any twins, kill the twins, because those twins are demons coming twice. Those were the things that were where our ancestors, God, you know, the gods of ancestors were asking them to do. Or if you're a Jewish person, you know, you were asked to do certain ceremonial things, follow certain calendars, do certain laws and all those kinds of things, and you must do all of them. So the follow-up question to what are we working for is, how do we know the works to do? What are we working for, and how do we know the works to do? What are we working for, and how do we know the works to do? And that's why in the preaching of the gospel, if a man talks about what Jesus has given us, but does not continue to what these questions, the person has not preached the gospel. So do you understand that? If a person preaches the gospel, having said what Jesus has given us as a free gift, but does not answer this question, the person has not preached the gospel. So that is why you see every single place, Peter, Paul, John, Everywhere where they talk about what Jesus has done for us, it always follows into the life that follows from receiving the gospel. It is inseparable. Church out together. 
So let's read from verse 1 to 6 first. It says, Galatians chapter 5 from verse 1 to 6 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So God has freed us. Now we're not working for something. We don't have shackles on us that determine, you know, that are constraining us. Rather, we have been free. So he now says that we should stand firm in our freedom. He was talking to them. Stand firm in your freedom because there are some people that were coming to them. You remember the background of the story, right? The background is that these are gentle people that received the gospel by grace. And then some people came from Jerusalem. They used the word men from James to qualify them. But what they mean is men from Jerusalem. That is not to say that James was a legalistic person. Church, do you understand that? Uh-huh. Because the same James was in the, Acts, in the book of Acts chapter 15, you know, consenting to and agreeing to what the gospel of Christ is. But well, these people were from Jerusalem, and so they identified themselves with the big men in Jerusalem. So the same men from James. But it's not to say that James was a legalistic apostle. Praise God. Because that, that needs to be clarified, because a lot of people think that James chapter 2, we now have heard all kinds of funny things, that James chapter 2 is James trying to solve Paul for grace and everything and all that. You see that James was even gentle. James was very gentle in James chapter 2. You will see what Paul said in this chapter. Paul is even worse. You see. Paul will just tell you, if you don't behave like you, you're not going to heaven. <laughs> Straight. No, this thing. No, it's a faith, it's a, it's a, it's a, those things. Show me your faith by your works. Sure, Paul tell you straight. If you live like this, you are going to hell. Simple. So there's a unity of doctrine among the apostles. Very important to always remember, right? So the background is that the Galatians, they were Gentiles, they're not Jewish people. So people came from Jerusalem to make them start doing Jewish practices and claiming that they have to do those Jewish practices for them to be real Christians. And Paul is now explaining to them that all those laws, we are not under them anymore because God has given us righteousness already. So that's why it's not in chapter, this, this verse 1, that they should, don't, they should not go back under any yoke of slavery. Hallelujah. Verse 2 now says, Look, I, Paul, say to you, that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. That means that if you accept to circumcise, because these people are Gentiles, and someone now came and told them that if you, don't, if you don't circumcise, you're not really Christians. And they will have used all kinds of things to try to convince them of that. Paul now says, listen, if you go back to circumcising, Christ is of no advantage to you. Because what happens is that you are on the, you are on the road of righteousness, having righteousness as a gift. You want to go back to the road, like that. those diagrams I showed you guys, the first two parts, right? You want to go back to the road of legalism where you are trying to work for your righteousness. If you get back into that road where you are trying to work for your righteousness, then there's no point. Then there's no point in Christ. Christ is of no point to you. Because if your righteousness is supposed to be a gift, but you say, no, I'm rejecting righteousness as a gift. I want to work for, my, for your righteousness. What is the point of the righteousness that was a gift? What is it? Pointless. It's like you are setting aside the grace of God to try to earn the grace of God by yourself. And in such a person, Christ cannot help you. So that's why it says Christ is of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. So that's another thing. They'll say, you know what, it's only circumcision and just doing a few days, doing a few days of um, recognition of um, Jewish ceremonial laws. So just circumcision. What well, is not telling them that it doesn't stop at just circumcision. No. If you want to follow the law, once you enter, you must circumcise. Then you are going to obey the whole law. And that's how we start. Look at what he now says. You follow now. He says, you are severed from Christ. You will be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. When you want to get your justification by yourself, you are falling away from the grace of God. So legalism is not the gospel. That's what Paul was saying in chapter 1 that we read earlier. Legalism is not the gospel. If you believe in a legalistic something about Jesus, what you believe is not the gospel. You are not a Christian in the sense of apostolic doctrine. These things are very important. Satan's greatest tool is to make it look like as if a little departure from apostolic doctrine is not a big deal. But brothers and sisters, look at what Paul now says after. He now says, For through the Spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the righteousness of Christ. For Christ, for in Christ, Jesus, neither circumcision nor circumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Look at what he now says. Um, I want to drop to verse, um, verse 9. Let me just go to verse 7. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven levels the whole lump. 
So Paul explaining something there that, see, it's not just a little circumcision. It's not just, you know what, let's just circumcise like Jewish people so we can be true Christians. It doesn't stop there. A little level levels the whole lump. Satan's tool, what Satan does is to make it look that like as if a little deviation from apostolic doctrine is okay. But Paul tells us something. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven there means yeast. Those, are, those, those of us that are big, you will understand what I'm saying. How much yeast do you need to turn a whole bread from flat bread to, to agege bread? How much? It's not very little. Tiny. That's all you need. You cannot say, ah, this cup of honey is very full. Um, what they put inside was just a drop of poison. It's just a drop of poison they put. So it's not too bad. At least the cup is big. So what is inside is just a drop of poison. You go drink them. Huh? So in Christianity, there are some things you don't negotiate. Listen to me. The impulse to negotiate error is Satan's work. That impulse to be comfortable with error. So you can see the kind of strong, strong words that Paul has been using in this, in this book. Can you guys see the kind of strong, strong words he has been using? From chapter 1, he's been cursing people. There's one he even said now, we're going to read. <laughs> <You> laugh. <laughs> because these things are non-negotiable. So travel together. Mm. Let's go back up to verse 4. It says, you are severed from Christ, you who will be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Now, Paul begins to answer the questions. Those questions we asked initially of, now that we have righteousness, what are we working for? And how do we know the right kind of works that are appropriate for this new road that we are on? And Paul begins to answer. Number one, what are we working for? What is the necessity of our works? Paul begins to tell us that, see, even your salvation, there's something you are still fighting towards. There's something you are still going through. The gospel that says that your salvation has been completed and there's no ongoing salvation and coming salvation is a lie. Look at the way he answers the question. He says, for through the Spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of what? Shebe, you said our righteousness is a gift in chapter 2. Why do you, you say you are righteousness is a gift, what are we hoping for again? Brothers and sisters, we've heard us say it many times in this church, let me say it again. You were saved from the power of sin by regeneration. That means that God changed your life. So because you, you, you had the, the, nature, the nature of Adam before, your desires, based on your nature, your desires were to do evil, right? But God now changed your heart and God changed your nature. So the power of sin, that is that compulsion, that desire to always want to do what God does not want. God has saved you from it by regeneration, by fixing your heart. Now you are desiring good things. Now you are desiring the will of God. We're going to look more from about that coming. In justification, you've been saved from the penalty of sin. That means that when God gave you the status of righteousness, the legal status of righteousness, he gave you that pardon and saved you and redeemed you. The penalty of sin, which is the judgment and the wrath of God, you have been saved from it. So the penalty for all the evil you have done, you have been saved from that penalty by justification. But brothers and sisters, there is still the practice of sin that is ongoing in us. And we are being saved from the practice of sin by sanctification. So that is why even now that we are, we, even now that we are on this earth, we may fall and we may stumble. We may do evil things. But there is a cleansing that is going on. There is a purification that is going on as we you know, work with God and as God works in us, purifying us and helping us to be stronger and better believers so that the practice of sin is being killed and we're mortifying the flesh every day. So God is saving us from the practice of sin through sanctification. And then God will save us from the presence of sin. The flesh that is inside of us is going to be delivered. That final changing of our, of our fundamental physical nature, whereby we now have glorified bodies, and also the sin that is in the world around us, the sin that is reigning in the world around us, that is the presence of sin. The presence of sin in our mortal bodies, in our flesh, and the presence of sin in this physical world, God will deliver us from the presence of sin in what? Glorification. So we were saved. We are being saved, and we will be saved. Anybody that does not preach it does not know the gospel of Christ. 
So Paul says that there's a hope of righteousness ahead of us. There's something called the hope of glory ahead of us. You have been regenerated and adopted. You have been justified. You are being sanctified. There's a hope of righteousness. There's a hope of eternal life. There's a hope of glory. Paul and the apostles uses different words ahead of us. There's a hope of inheritance. He says you have given us an inheritance. Then that tells us that there's still an inheritance waiting for us. Paul will tell us that we have an inheritance in Christ. That we have received an inheritance according to the riches of his glory. Peter will tell us that we still have an inheritance in heaven that is waiting for us that no moth or rust can touch. So we still have something ahead of us. So we still have something we are walking towards. And that is the reason why Paul tells us, in, look at, look at, let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 29 says, For those he, whom he foreknew, he also was predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you see that? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in, either that he, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also what? So that means that the work that God is doing in your life, when he foreknew you and predestined you, when he justified you, there's a gap that we usually like to miss there, is that he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. So, and then those that he justified, he also what? Glorified. So that means that the same God that regenerated you, the same God that justified you, he also predestined you that you are meant to be sanctified and to look more like Jesus. You cannot say he justified me, but the confirmation to the son is not there. And the glory that is coming, you can miss it. No, everything must be complete. Did you hear what I just said now? So that is the reason why after we have received the righteousness of God, after we have received the nature of God, this nature must show until the end of our journey. So you cannot say you have received the righteousness, therefore there is nothing to work for more, work for anymore. No, your life as a Christian must follow. It is inseparable. There is no justification and regeneration without sanctification. Church, have together. Look at verse 6. Now it says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And so he now answers the question. So we know what we are working for is that we have a glory ahead of us. So our Christianity is not just a dead Christianity that doesn't have anything ahead of it. Rather, we have a coming glory that is coming. So we are working towards our glory. We are living the life that follows aiming for our glory. He now says that neither circumcision nor circumcision accounts for anything, but faith working through love. So how do we know the kind of works we'll be doing in this working towards glory? He says it's not the Lord that will tell you anymore. It's not circumcision that tells you what to do or what circumcision. Those things don't count for anything. What counts? What matters? What will tell you how to you behave? And we're going to see it more in the, as we go on now. Is that it's faith working through love. That when a man puts his trust in God, he cannot but love Jesus. And it is this love for Jesus that would define how he lives his life. Do you hear what I just said now? He says, faith walking through love. When a man puts his faith in Jesus, when a man trusts Jesus, you have seen what Jesus has done, and you put your trust in Jesus to help you. What happens is that there's a love that pours out from your heart because of what Jesus has done. And that love that pours out from your heart is what now constrains and controls your behavior. So I hear what I'm saying to you. So Paul gives us a gentle reminder that there's something yet ahead. Antinomians preach that there's nothing ahead. But there is. And thus, those who, will re- those who will receive it are those who persevere to the end. Hallelujah. The second question is answered, that faith walking through love guides our works. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Says, for the love of Christ controls us. Do you see that? For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for who, for their sake, died and was what? Any man that sees what Jesus did for him. What happens is that that man's old nature dies, like we said in the second part. 
And what happens is that that man now begins to live for God. It is that love for God that controls the way a man lives. The love of God controls us. So you don't need the law of Moses to tell you how to behave. Necessarily, of course, you can learn. You understand what I'm saying here? But telling someone to circumcise or not circumcise and obey certain days is not what will tell you how to behave, right? Um, neither is it your pagan laws, the pagan laws of your ancestors that will tell you how to behave. What tells you how to behave is that because you have put your trust in Jesus, faith, walking through the love of God that pours in your heart. The love of God controls us. If you love God, you will behave like a child of God. <laughs> Church, I hear what I'm saying to you. Those who have come to trust in Jesus will love, will fall in love with him. Those who have come to trust in Jesus will fall in love with him. And those who are in love with him will live for him. You hear what I just said? Man? Those who put their trust in Jesus will fall in love with him. And those who are in love with him will live for him. Look at which Apostle John puts it. You can see the unity of the scriptures. All the apostles were teaching the same thing. First John chapter 2. This particular thought, some, John said it over and over, but let's just use one. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 from verse 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for us only, but for, for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus is the propitiation for sins. Look at the way he now, he now continues. He now says in verse 3, And by this we know that we have come to know him. If we do what? Keep his commandments. So after you realize that Jesus has, has died for your sins, the, the, the evidence that you truly know God is that you obey his commandments. So there is nothing like, I believe your Jesus died for me, but I'm behaving like a non-believer. It's not possible. Do you see that? Guys, can you see it? This is how we know those that Jesus actually died for them and they believe that Jesus died for them and Jesus is the propitiation for their sins. If they know God, they will keep his commandments. Verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a what? And the truth is not... Brothers and sisters, it is with this confidence that I can tell people confidently that if a person asks that if I'm fornicating on the day Jesus comes, what will happen? I can say confidently the person is not saved. When you say it outside, it sounds like as if you are harsh. But it's true. Those that know him, they keep his commandments. You are not going to be fornicating the day Jesus comes because you keep his commandments. If you are saying we know the gospel and the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, I'm righteous of God in Christ Jesus, but you are living like an unbeliever, you are a liar. And the truth is not in you. Christians are within their right to say that as far as we can judge, you are not a Christian. You don't say that here what I'm saying to you. John said such people are liars. Look at verse 5. He says, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is what? Because when you love God, you want to please him. When you realize what Jesus has done, it's not a question of, imagine asking your wife, um, sweetie, what if I'm committing adultery and you enter the house, what will happen? <laughs> See, if your husband asks you that question, you understand? Yeah, yeah you understand. <laughs> All of you that are in a relationship, if they are asking you those kind of foolish questions, what, what will you do if they commit adultery? Hey, why, what are you asking for? Do you have plans? You that you love someone so much that your imagination is, Lord, the day you come, you are going to meet me evangelizing. Lord, the day you come, I want you to meet me on the pulpit. Lord, the day you come, I want you to meet me where I am serving my brothers and sisters. You, that is not what is you are thinking of. You have enough imagination to be... <laughs> Look at verse 6. It now says, whoever says he abides in me ought to walk in the same way in which he will. 
So the love of God is what constrains us. Neither circumcision nor circumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Because God has done so much for us and we have trust him, we have put our trust in him to save us. He has done such a good thing that our heart is boiling over with so much gratitude because love engenders love. Love engenders love. Great love begs in return for great love. Great love engenders great love in return. If not for our broken natures and all the you know, our broken psychology and our depravity. When a man is walking in good, and when a man's heart is pure, when a person shows you love, your intuitive response is to love the person in return. Everybody here can understand it, you can relate to it. The time when you feel, you know, most in love with your culture, you know, there's a feeling of love. There's a time when you know love is a duty and there's a feeling, you understand it? The time when you have that strongest delight, that sweetest delight in your children is when your child does something very cute, expressing their love to you. Like you are lying down in the bed after work and your cute baby just comes and meets you on the bed and just hugs you and says, oh daddy, I love you and gives you, you'll be feeling the love. <laughs> because love engenders love. When your partner, without planning or without anything, shows you that they are constantly thinking of you by bringing a gift out of the blues or does an act of service out of the blues or is concerned for you out of the blues, you feel the love that engenders love. So when you realize what Jesus has done for us, it engenders love in return. It is that love in return that controls us. It is that love in return that constrains us. That guides our behavior. There are some questions you don't ask. There are some gray area questions. You know, because in morality, there are a lot of gray areas. The answer to gray area questions is the love of God. The answer to gray area questions is what? The love of God. There are some questions that don't come from people that love God. The answer to gray area questions is the love of God. That's why at the end of the day, when Paul was going to address the issue of... Um, Food offered to idols and whether people have the right. Because there's some believers that they genuinely believe I'm saved. All those food gods that go chop and nothing they want, nothing they happen. So people would grow up in Babalawo's house that they've seen jazz that happens when you sacrifice your God. So if they, whenever they eat the food, they are still feeling like as if the demon is inside of them. But both of them believe in what Jesus has done and none of them are wrong. Paul says that kind of gray area question, what is the answer to it? Walk in love towards each other. Those of you that are strong, don't eat it because it will vex your, your you understand? The answer to gray area questions is what? Love. Because love is what constrains us. Hallelujah. And brothers and sisters, are we together? Look at, let's, let's continue. Verse 7 now says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from he who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Hallelujah. They sin. They sin. Brothers and sisters, all of us have a commission to preach the gospel. So this applies to us all, and not just to teachers, but more so to teachers. This applies doubly to teachers. Hmm. You are not justified to leaven the lump for any reasons whatsoever. You are not justified to preach error or heresy for any reason whatsoever. Paul says the people that are troubling you, they will bear the penalty. <laughs> he says they will bear, James warned, he said, don't be in a hurry to be called a teacher. Because teachers are going to receive double strokes. All these things that people are doing because you are preaching certain things, people are, you are getting people's attention. You notice that when you preach a little level, that's when people turn up. That's when people so see. That's when people respond. And because of that, you, you, you allow yourself to begin to preach just a little level. Just a little level. So that people's faith can be stirred up. Just a little exaggeration of the testimony. So that people can know that God is powerful. Just a little exaggeration of how the miracle happened. So that people can really see how big and powerful God is. And they can know that there's an anointing on your life. Just a little manipulation. For them to see you because they are not respecting you well enough. And if they don't respect you, you cannot be useful to them. So just a little manipulation for them to, for you to control them a little bit to do what you want. Just a little level. He says, Paul says, see, if you believe in this Christianity, 
If you believe in this Bible, this scripture will be heavy on your head. It says they will bear the penalty. All these things that people are doing, you are flexing. You, are, you think it's a joke. He says these people will bear the penalty in chapter 1. He used a very heavy word. He said they are cursed. It's not a joke. Because these are people's lives you are playing with. This is people's eternity that you are playing with. It's not a joke. We've gotten so comfortable we don't even fear God. We don't even fear God anymore. There are certain kind of trembling that a man who truly knows God will have. There's a way you tremble that even when someone comes and tells you that what you are teaching is wrong, you will be restless. You will search that, ah, could I truly be wrong? You will be, you will be restless. Those of you that have been in this church, you know, at least in the last one or two years, you understand what I'm saying? We discover that, ah, this thing that we are doing it's not really biblical, though. It's because of the way we met church here that we are doing it. We are just doing what they have been doing. This thing is not really biblical. You will see, you will agonize. You will agonize. People, there are some people that will not be comfortable with the change. You will be, you will be in pain. You will be thinking in the night. You will be arguing with your wife. You will call your guys. You will be arguing, arguing, trying to make sure because it's not a joke. Because you know this thing is not a joke. These are people's lives. Paul says they will bear the penalty. Brothers and sisters, let us have high value for the word of God. Preach what is true. Ah, now it says in verse 11, but if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. So whenever a person begins to treat, preach the true gospel, like we read earlier, the son of Hagar, the son of the bond woman, will persecute him. Because the gospel is offensive to legalists. It's offensive. It takes away the power of the self. It takes away the power of the man of God. It, take, it takes away the, um, the stature of the organization. The gospel is offensive. And so, people will be persecuted for preaching it. And then he now ends with another strong statement. He says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. In case you don't realize what's happening here, this is a very, very strong statement. So what Paul is referring to is that they are telling believers to come and, Gentiles to come and circumcise again. He now says, I wish you would never stop at circumcision. Who castrate yourselves? They use the very toned down word so that it doesn't, you know, it's Bible right here. <laughs> so you don't read Bible and you see strong words inside. But what Paul said here was actually very strong. It was a very strong word. He said, I wish you would not just stop. Don't just stop at circumcision. Who, who cut everything away? She be you want to circumcise. That's what he was saying. She be you want to circumcise. May you cut it off. That's what he was saying. And what was he referring to? So there's a goddess in Galatia, right? In the Phrygian regions of Galatia. The name of that goddess was Cybele or Gali, whatever the name you want to call her. One of the her priests and priestesses, when a man becomes a priest of Cybele, one of the things that he does is that he castrates himself. He castrates himself and starts wearing women's clothes. You see, that is not new. <laughs> he actually castrates himself and starts doing men's clothes. Then he also becomes he also become like a temple prostitute so that men that want to, you know, that's how they raise money for the temple. Right? Men go there, sleep with these people, and raise money for the temple. And this area is the priest, this is where the priest of Galatia is. So they knew what he was talking about. So the priests of Galatia, of Cybele in Galatia, that's what they were doing. So that's why he was referring to it. That she people want to be legalistic. Who could go the way and behave like berries and cut everything off? Strong statements. Because it is not a joke. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. But this is also to let you guys know something, right? That everything you are seeing in the world today is not new. In fact, the reason why it feels strange that men are um, doing all this transgender surgery and everything is because Christianity has reigned for so long that all these weird things have seemed now seem strange. Human beings, normally, usually, that's how they behave. 
It's after Christianity rose in the West and banished all those nonsense behaviors that people now, for like 2,000 years, like I see all those things were strange. Ah, what kind of strange? Normally, human beings normally. We are mad people. It's Christianity that toned down the madness of the whole world. You guys don't know. The heat of the craziness in this world, Christianity toned it down. And so that is the reason why, as you are raising your child, those of you that are, should I say fortunate or let me say fortunate, to travel abroad. I was about to say fortunate or fortunate. <laughs> to travel abroad, to live abroad and everything, right? Depending on the call of God upon your life. Don't be afraid. If it is truly God that sent you there, don't be afraid. Because your ancestors, the people they were living with are madder than the people you are living with now. <laughs> and their children did not spoil. Their children were even stronger. Their children were distinct. I hear what I'm saying to you. So don't be afraid. Say, yeah, okay, say, okay, okay, okay. don't worry. Do the right thing. Teach them the word. Catechize them, all right? Dedicate them. Let's <laughs> say baptize them. Dedicate them to God. Don't worry, trust God. Because if the Christians in the first century could overcome this kind of level, of, this one I just said now is just to spill. Let me not go to what the Romans and Nicole were doing. If their children could survive, your children will be fine. Praise God. So, Paul answered the question, what are we working for? And how do we know what to do? And he keeps on answering the question. So, following now, he now tells us, how do we live for Christ, right? How, this new life that we are working, how are we doing it? Verse 16 now says, um, oh, sorry, I seem to have jumped. Verse 13, he says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So when we have love, it is our love for God. It's one of the way my brothers put it. He says, there's only one person that we truly love. There's only one love that we have as Christians. It's a good way of um, articulating this concept. That there's only one person that we truly love is God. And every other thing around us that we love is enjoying the overflow of the love that we have for God. So the reason why we love human beings is because we love God. And God loves them. When you love God, you love the people that he loves. So you understand what I'm saying? It's because of God. It's because of what Jesus has done for me. I love him. And I know that God loves you, so I will love you. So that love that we have for God constrains us to even love our brothers and sisters. He now says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So this idea that Jesus has done everything. So even if you are now, even, even, even now when you fall into sin, that sin does not count. And you don't need to confess it. You don't need to pray. You don't need to ask God to, to forgive you and to cleanse you. That's a lie. That's a lie. He says, because your freedom that you now have is freedom to serve God, not freedom to live anyhow. He says, so don't use your freedom as an opportunity but for, the, for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. So your freedom is you are free now to love people and to serve God. He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one law, in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so... Verse 16 now says, don't forget, look at where it started from. It says, we should walk in love towards one another. It now says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so you see, you know, the Bible is not written in chapter so you can understand the thought. Walking in love towards God and towards people is walking in the Spirit. Because there's an esoteric sense you can have about walking in the Spirit. When someone tells you that um, you should walk in the Spirit, and so what that means is that whenever you're taking your step, let the voice tell you what to do. Don't just move anyhow. Don't just go into your day without committing to God. Let the Holy Spirit direct you more. Both in Romans chapter 8 and here, Paul tells us what walking in the Spirit is. That means that the things that cohere with the Spirit, the things that are of the Spirit of God, the things that are like the Spirit of God, the things that are manifested or fruits of the Spirit of God, are the things that you do to say when you walk in the Spirit. So when you are walking in love and walking in faith towards people, love towards people, you are walking in the world, Spirit. When you come to church, instead of streaming service, what are you doing? Walking in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Do you understand that? When you follow what is convenient for your body and stay home to stream instead, that's walking in the flesh. It's not something esoteric. When someone says something very nasty that you ought to give the person back, but you just love, because Jesus loves you, because I love Jesus and Jesus loves you, I will just, you know, you are walking in the Spirit. So he now says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so this is something very, very important that you must now realize. Is that while we are in this world, 
we have the flesh. And that flesh has its own desires. But at the point of regeneration, God did something for us. So this is the thing, right? Brother Jonathan alluded to this yesterday in our doctrines of Jesus. By the way, we'll finish for this um, half year. Best, best group so far. The sweets may die. Anyway, let us continue. Right? So before, before we had the Holy Spirit, before the God, God fixed our hearts, we had a nature. And that nature is the nature that we received from Adam. Right? We had that nature. And the kind of nature you have determines the kind of desires that you have. Do you understand that? It's because you are not the nature of a goat that you don't desire to be eating grass. Right? The kind of nature you have, the kind of um, nature you have will determine the kind of desires that you have. So we had the nature that we received from Adam. And that, is, that, that nature, after man fell, because of the kind of sin that they committed, in that Satan came and told them, you will not surely die, but your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing what is good and evil. It was a sin of pride. It was a sin of the self. And so, in consummating that evil temptation, that temptation, we inherited the nature from Adam that is all about the self. It's all about me, 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 me. What is, what is, what is um, sweet to my flesh? It's all about you know, gratifying my flesh. It's all about gratifying my desires. That is the kind of nature that we had. The problem is that when you have desires like that, you cannot deal with desires by denying them. I hear what I'm saying to you. You cannot deal with desires by denying them because it's in nature. It is there. You cannot ignore it and say, I don't look. It's not there. It's not there. I deny it. And that's what many times we do in our Christian work. You have desires in the flesh and you are, you are telling yourself they are not there. They are not there. No. Let me tell you how God killed those desires. Let me tell you how the Lord is working on us to kill those desires. Is that after we got saved, God now gave us a new life and a new nature. This new nature is not just thinking about, it's not thinking about itself anymore because God, what Jesus has done for us and he has fixed us, what our desire now, our nature is a nature that wants to serve God. It's a nature that loves God. So we, when, we, when God regenerated us, we now have a new heart. We now have a new desire. And our desire is to do the will of God. Our new desire is to what? Do the will of God. And so the way God kills the flesh and crucifies the flesh for us is by giving us this new nature with new desires so that we don't need to be denying the flesh. Rather, we kill the flesh by giving into our new nature. So our new desire kills our own nature. Let me give an analogy that will help you understand. It will sound crude, but you will understand when I explain it. A man is in the moment and he feels like as if he's under, he's in, he's under the spell of a sexual temptation. He's in a private place with a woman and he's under, um, you know, he's about to commit um, sexual sin. And the thing is strong on him. And you know, many guys can understand what I'm saying. It will feel like as if I must see this sin through. Like I don't have a choice, it must be done. But if in the heat of the moment, the person that God sent, oh, sorry, that Satan sent to destroy our lives now tells you, before we continue, let me tell you, I have HIV AIDS. <laughs> what happens to that desire? What happens to it? Now, did you deny the desire to commit sin? What overturned it? A desire to live long. <laughs> Church, I hear what I'm saying to you. The thing that kills wrong desires is a greater desire. The thing that kills the temporary desires of the flesh to get temporary relief of the self, self, self is a greater and more beautiful desire to serve God with our lives. When a man loves God and the man has seen the beauty of God and the man wants to love God, killing the flesh becomes so easy. All those mechanical Christianity and Christianity that is sinusoidal, that you are going up today and coming down, going up today and coming down, it's because you are going around about it the wrong way. What the Bible says is to walk in the spirit. Walk in accordance with the new nature. You have new desires. You want to please God. And these desires that you have, these new desires that you have based on your new nature, are far more satisfying than the, no, than the desires of your old nature. Why not enjoy the new thing that God has given you? Why not yield yourself to the new thing that God has given you? 
Why not use your members for your new desires, for the new pleasures that God has given you to enjoy? Hallelujah. Praise God. Look at verse 17. It says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Do you see that? And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. They are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So the law does not tell you what to do. And does the law give you your righteousness? Because you are living by the spirit. Verse 19 now says, now the works of the flesh are evidence. Sexual immorality, number. So you see, it's a perennial problem. It's a perennial problem. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you as I warned you before. He says, I'm warning you as I warned you before. That those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who live like this are telling us that what they have is only an old nature. They do not have a desire to please God. So those that live like this are not going to heaven. It's saying there's no middle ground. You cannot tell me I have a new nature, but all that is manifested in your new nature is the nature of, of the flesh. It's not possible. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? He said, I have a new nature, but all my desires are for the flesh. It's a lie. And those that live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He now says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no... He says, and those who belong to Christ, Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh with his passions and what? Desires. You see that? So the way we crucify the flesh with his desires, the flesh, the nature with his desires, the way Jesus did that for us, the way we have crucified it is that God has given us a new nature in its place. So the vestiges of, that, of those old desires, they are killed and they are being killed by the fact that we have a new nature with new desires. <laughs> Church, are we together? Praise God. So we don't kill desires by denying them. You kill desires by overriding them with greater desires. In the past, we could not desire things greater than the flesh. But when Jesus touched our hearts, he fixed our nature, our nature in regeneration. Now we can desire things greater than the things that the flesh desire. If you are led by the Spirit and walking in faith through love, the law is not the source of your righteousness. So the desires of the flesh are all to please the self. What it enjoys are things that pleasures its senses. In your old nature, you wanted to just please yourself. What you enjoyed were just things that titillated your senses. And so that is why people even go to our things like witchcraft. Because you are very, very angry with someone. And you cannot physically get retribution. So you go to, help, you go to seek demons for help. To help you get that retribution that you could not get physically. What are orgies? Just giving in, you know... Yourself, so your carnal desires. All those things. Idolatry. What is idolatry? I've said it many times. The reasons that the things that you put above God are things that give you the, the, pleasures, the pleasures of yourself. I, that's what idolatry is. I idolize my personal comfort too much. I idolize my personal enjoyment too much. Therefore, the things that give me this personal enjoyment, I put them above God. I enjoy those things more than I enjoy God. Therefore, I put those things above God. That's where all of these things come from. That's where all these things come from. Again, why are you streaming service on Sunday instead of coming to church? Because you have put your personal comfort on Sunday above God. Simple. That's why in the Old Testament, like we talked about two Wednesdays ago, ignoring the Sabbath is quasi-idolatry, is hidden idolatry. That's why the judgment was so tough. If you cannot give one day of the week to God, whatever it is you are doing on that day that you meant to give to God is something you hold higher than God. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. Because ignoring the Lord's day is a hidden idolatry. So are we together? Where does enmity and dissensions come from? You want your way to be done. You are in church. We are deciding on something. But you want your own, your own decision to be done. So because of that, you fight people. Those that don't give you your way, you don't forget and you're bitter against them. You want your personal satisfaction of retribution. That your own way must be gone. All these things is about the self. That was the old nature that we had. Praise God. 
Those who live like this will not enter the glory of God. But the desires of the Spirit are towards God. So now that we have a new nature, our desire is towards God. And so the things that we enjoy are things that are the will of God. Because we love God so much, we now enjoy God and the things that are his will for us. And so doing the will of God is sweeter. When we give up our former life, our new life now has new desires. And those old desires don't control us anymore. So let us live in the new nature, pursuing our new desires and satisfying ourselves in its pleasures. Now that we have a new nature, brothers and sisters, let us pursue our new desires and let us be satisfied with, with them, with the pleasures thereof. Now that we have a new nature, my brothers and sisters, let us pursue the desires of this new nature and let us be satisfied with it. We are believers. Now there are some things that are sweet to us. Because the pleasures of our new desires, of our new nature, they exceed the pleasures of our old nature. They do. Praise God. Amen. Let me use the example that came, one of the examples that came up yesterday during our meeting, and I'll use some other ones. The pleasure of peace of mind, the pleasure of security, the pleasure of comfort, the pleasure of knowing that you're not disobeying God by having sex within the bounds of marriage is a sweeter pleasure than stolen waters. Sleeping with someone that you're not committed to. Sleeping with someone that can still break your heart. Opening your entire inmost parts to someone that is just using you for their own personal gratification. Someone that has not promised you anything. Someone that is not loyal to you. Opening yourself to people that are using you for their own pleasure. The pleasure of looking forward to a time when you have your own ride or die that will be there for you in sickness and in health. That even when you fall sick, the person will be there for you. That pleasure far exceeds the momentary pleasure of fornication and sexual immorality. Why don't we pursue that? It is sweeter, it is better. Instead of doing um, sinful things, the pleasure of those sinful temporary things, that after that, you start looking for posting or two and start panicking that maybe you are pregnant and you are all those kinds of things. Instead of pursuing that, why don't we pursue something better? It is better. It is. It is sweeter. Hallelujah. Amen. Instead of pursuing temporary pleasures that can come with betrayal and heartbreak, why don't we pursue something better? There is a pleasure in integrity when you're a faithful person, when you're a man of your word, when you're a diligent person, when people in the office and in your business know that you're a man of your word, that when he says this, he means this. The pleasure of being known as a faithful man, the pleasure of having a good name, far exceeds the temporary pleasures of lying and scheming and being duplicitous and lying and all those things, cutting corners, you are cutting corners. Eventually, people will find out and your name is destroyed. You are cutting corners and you are harming other people. You are cutting corners and you are destroying other people's lives. Meanwhile, there's, an, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a new life that we have, a new nature. You know you're a child of God. You know you want to live for God. Pursue it. Walk in the spirit. You have a new life. You want to live for God. Pursue it. That is the way. Stop asking yourself, I have this desire to lie. How can I ignore it? No. Ask yourself, what does my new nature want? My new nature wants to be a forthright person. That when I say something, I don't need to be remembering the things I said before. That my story is the same consistently. It's a sweet thing. Pursue it. So I hear what I'm saying to you. Are you in church this morning? The pleasure of the fruits of diligence exceeds the pleasure of laziness. Our flesh wants to be lazy. Our flesh doesn't want to do anything. But we have a new nature. There's a new nature that wants to exert itself. There's a new nature that knows that one day God is going to ask me to give account for this business I'm doing. He's going to ask me to give account for this thing I'm doing. That new nature wants to serve God. He wants to do the right thing. Pursue it. The pleasure of being a diligent man. Of being a man that people know that you don't play with your work in the office. That pleasure is far sweeter than the pleasure of being lazy. Postponing your work, postponing, 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 and then eventually you now do a shabby work, and the people are just managing you. That pleasure of not doing anything in that moment 
It's nothing compared to the pleasure of being known as a man that did the right thing. That in your heart you are serving your employer as a man that is serving God. We don't think about our new nature enough. We don't think about our new desires enough. When you think about your new desires, you discover that they are actually sweeter than those ones. Pursue them, brothers and sisters. Having a new nature, let us pursue its desires thereof and be satisfied in its pleasure. Let us pursue the desires of our new nature and be satisfied in its pleasures. The pleasures of a healthy body far exceed the pleasures of gluttony. Having no discipline in eating and the pleasure of constantly eating anyhow, eating five times a day, snacking on everything, taking drinks every time, every time, every time. It gives temporary pleasure, but in this economy, self, it don't even calm down. Yes, <laughs> but you see, for when the economy gets better, let's just continue, right? The pleasures of being healthy, the pleasures of self-control, the pleasures of not dying at 40, not because God has said you will die, but in the eternal decree anyway, but dying because you are just eating anyhow. You are sick, by the time you are 50, you are sick, you can't move your body anymore. The pleasures of a healthy body far exceed the pleasure of taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit. Far exceed the pleasures of just eating anyhow. Brothers and sisters, the pleasures of walking in love with my brothers and sisters, instead of, instead of backbiting and slander, there's a temporary pleasure you get from someone did something to you. You are telling another person about what happened and you tell the person that doesn't need to know, but in a way that would destroy that person's um, character and assassinate the impression that people have about that person. There's a pleasure that comes because there's a vindication, there's a satisfaction. But that pleasure is nothing compared to the pleasure of walking in love towards people. There's nothing compared to it. The sweetness of walking in love towards your brother, that your mind is clear, that at every point in time you are pursuing the good of your brothers and sisters in church. The pleasure of walking in love towards people, that there's someone that has an issue and I'm eager to help them and to see their lives better, even if I don't get anything in return. The satisfaction of walking in love far exceeds the pleasure of backbiting, slander, envy, jealousy, and all those kinds of things. The fruit of the Spirit is far sweeter than the fruit of the flesh. It is. The pleasures of contentment far exceed the pleasures of greed. We talked about it, so... It's because you are greedy, I want to be rich, I want to be rich, I want to be king of financial, I want to be rich, I want to be rich. I want to be rich, I want to be rich. You now be doing all kinds of inconvenient things that are bringing perdition to your souls. When you have not made as much money as you wanted to make, you feel like as if there's something wrong with you. One of our sisters talk about her testimony. Year in, year out, you are asking yourself, I have not achieved what I wanted to achieve. What is wrong with me? I have not achieved what I wanted to achieve. I told myself I'll make one million. My resolution at the beginning of the year was I'll make one million before the end of the year. I did not achieve it. 2001, 2022, 2023, I've not achieved it. What is wrong with me? The pleasures of greed are painful. Even when you now finally make the money, you now get into a new social economic class and look around. Everybody's your mate there. Now you're looking for something else to show. And it is giving you hypertension. It's giving you depression. It's giving you a sense of not having a personal self-worth. The pleasures of contentment are far better. That I can eat, I can drink, I have clothes in my body. God has taken care of me. What I need to do, the will of God for my life, I have it already. I'm working to be productive, not for anybody to make me feel better about myself. If I have more money, glory to God. But if I don't, I'm fine. The pleasures and the calmness. You walk if it is do not have if you don't have a car, you have a car that you drive your car to the glory of the Lord. Nobody can move your leg, they should splash water on you. Jesus has accepted me in the beloved. The, the pleasures of the peace from contentment far exceed this thing delivered. I was telling my wife about it last night. I was talking about it that when did I change? Because when I met her, I was promising her that I will build multinational for her and that she'll be the queen. I don't know when I changed. <laughs> I was not asking her that when, when did this thing change? I was thinking about my life yesterday. Nobody can make me to run Kirakita. Nobody. If you like, have Homer. Let your jets be nothing. If you like, have anything. Let your church be one million. Nothing. As I did like this, I did okay. The pleasures of contentment far exceed the pleasures of greed. So having a new nature, brothers and sisters, let us pursue the desires thereof and let us be satisfied in it. Finally, finally, on that day, our Lord will return. Ah, and that day when he returns, the pleasures of his approval, the pleasures of his approval 
will wipe out and blot out all the memory of your suffering. It will make you look back and all the things that you suffered because you wanted to please him, you will now be thanking God for them. If he asks you, do you want to go and do those things again? Go and suffer those things again. If it will arrive you at this moment where I'm, I'm pleased with you, you will say yes. I'm telling you, you will say yes. If we were created for him, if the consummation and the perfection of our nature is in him, you best believe that on that day when we see him and our purpose is final, and our purpose finally reaches his climax because we were created to please him. And the satisfaction of our purpose, of our entire being, is that the person that created us for himself will tell us that you have done well. My brothers and sisters, that eternal present moment will wipe out your 70 years of suffering for him. It will make everything to be okay. On that day, there will literally be no more sorrow, no more pain. You will not even have a memory of it. You will look back at it and laugh. It will be worth it. If this is our new nature, why don't we pursue it? Brothers and sisters, if you are struggling with any sexual sin, let me tell you something that will help you. You have a new nature. You want to please God. Pursue it. Let your, remember your desire to want to do the right thing. Remember your desire to not want to contribute to the evil of this world. Remember your desire to be one to pleasing unto God. Let it fuel you. Let your love for God, that God, if you could come down, take on your flesh and kill and die for me, then the death I'm experiencing in not going into this website is nothing compared to what you did for me. It's too small for me to do in return. For you to die for me, that pain I'm going through by ignoring that website when I'm alone is nothing compared to what you have done for me. Let your pleasure to please God. Let his fire exceed. All those things. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the, fruit, the, the pleasures of the flesh. Having a new nature, let us pursue the desires and be satisfied in the pleasures thereof. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, there is a... There's a present-mindedness that Christianity requires where you are self-aware of the work of God in your life, where you are, what you ought to be doing that you're not yet doing. There's this self-awareness. So, you know, from that sense of self-awareness, I want you to spend some time, a few minutes, just talking to the Lord. Talk to the Lord about the new nature. You have a new heart, and your heart wants to please God. And in the places where your desires, where those desires, you have not been pursuing those desires because you are used to pursuing the desires of the flesh. So you have not yet tasted and enjoyed what it is like to, to please God. You've not yet tasted the sweetness of pleasing God in your life. I want to pray for the help of God. Pray for the help of your God that you walk according to the Spirit. That you walk according to the Spirit. You are not thinking of just consuming your you know, things upon your flesh and just... Um, you know, living for your flesh, but now you want to live to please God. Ask for the help of God. Those places where it looks like as if there are certain good things that you know you ought to do, but they don't feel sweet to you. Pray that the Lord will help you, that you can begin to see how sweet doing those things for God actually are. You begin to see how sweet doing those things for God actually are. Ask that the Lord will help you to enjoy the sweetness and delight of knowing Him of serving him and doing that is right, of following this new nature that you have, of following this new nature you have in everything that you do, in every place of your engagement, in every place where the Lord has put you to serve, that the Lord will help you, that the Lord will help you, that the Lord will help you. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, to pursue the desires of my new nature and to be satisfied thereof. Help me, Lord, to pursue the desires of my new nature and to be satisfied with it. Help me, Lord, to see the sweetness of fellowship with you. Help me to enjoy the sweetness of studying your word, of devotion to you, of loving people, of trusting you all the time, of walking in holiness and righteousness. Help me to enjoy the sweetness. Help me to see the sweetness in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father in heaven. Thank you, Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we have prayed. 
is allow me to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for your people. Pray for your children. All these people that are not here by accident, but they are here by the deliberate working of your foreknowledge. You have called them out of the world and out of their different families and different backgrounds. In this broken and painful world where all kinds of things have happened to them, Lord, in your wisdom, you have called them out to yourself to be your people and to be your children. You've given them a new heart whereby they want to serve you. They want to love you. They want to live their lives for you. Lord, Holy Spirit, I ask that you do a work in their hearts and stir up the fire. Those who have been used to the pleasures of the flesh and they have not experientially seen the sweetness of walking with you in the spirit. They have not experientially tasted of the goodness of serving you rather than giving to their flesh. Lord, I ask that you walk, walk this change in their lives. That you walk this change in their hearts. Let your people begin to see the sweetness of walking with you. Let them begin to enjoy the delight of serving you. Let them begin to see the beauty of loving you and trusting you and living for you. In the name of Jesus, help them to shift their gaze from fulfilling the pleasures of their flesh, but to fulfilling the pleasures of your presence. Help your people, O Lord, and help us to fulfill your purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Please say amen to these prayers. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your sacrifices. May he grant you the desires of your heart and fulfill all your plans. May we shout in joy over your salvation and may we lift up banners in the name of our God. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Some may trust in chariots and some may trust in horses. Some may trust in their own abilities and some may trust in their money and their fame. But we will trust in the name of our Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Hallelujah. God bless you. Please have your seat.